Good evening. I'm Graham Allison, the director of the Belfer Center, and it's my great uh, pleasure and honor to welcome home Frank Fukuyama, the 2014 Godkin Lecturer. So uh, Frank uh, was a student of Sam Huntington, our late great colleague, and indeed if you asked uh, about whom I'm sure you'll hear more from Frank uh, tonight, but if you ask of his many remarkable students, which one comes closest to kind of walking in his shoes, I would say it's Frank. From his celebrated 1992 uh, book, bestseller uh, called The End of History, to his newest book, it's called Political Order and Political Decay, which is a hefty tome, but I told him I couldn't figure out which chapter I would leave out because it's so much... Uh, uh, so interesting and so much fun. He's a serious thinker about very, who asks very big questions and like Sam Huntington follows the evidence and the analysis uh, wherever they lead, often to conclusions that people find quite uncomfortable. Uh, the Economist in its review of this book of uh, political order and political decay had a line which made me somewhat uncomfortable uh, but which I think uh, uh, any of us would wish that uh, at least for our mothers were written about uh, us in which they say quote a basic rule of intellectual life is that celebrity destroys quality the more famous an author becomes the more likely he is to produce hot air. That, of course, would never happen at Harvard. <laughs> but he goes on to say, Frank Fukuyama is a glorious exception to that rule. And that's certainly the case. So, in a two-volume undertaking that he's been about for some time, starting with this Origin of Political Order, which was published in 2011, uh, Frank begins with ancient China and marches through the centuries to the French Revolution. And in the second volume, the one that's just now published, he marches from Napoleon to today and the current state of American democracy, which is a particular topic under the heading political decay. He's a hardcore believer in democracy, so he finds some of his conclusions uncomfortable, especially to him. But uh, he's tr trying to explore the conditions under which market-based democracies succeed, as he puts it in a single phrase, uh, why do some nations behave like Denmark and most don't? And he argues that successful rights and market-based democracies combine three essential elements. The state itself, the rule of law, and accountability of government. And he goes on to try to explain why those three don't necessarily go together in every case particularly relevant for this school of government where our Dean David Elwood has a major project at the schools involves many members of the faculty on trying to make democracy work. Uh, Frank has become a trenchant critic of the dysfunctions of democratic institutions and practices, especially those on display in Washington today. So he talks about the decay of political institutions which includes a devastating analysis that goes from vetocracy, that is the excessive vetoes over pos positive action, to interest group capture or oligarchy, and the legislative and judicial strangleholds, all grounded in what uh, one of the reviewers called the complacent worship of a dysfunctional system. So that should be enough to stir us up a little bit. The Godkin Lectures are Harvard's most distinguished endowed series. Former Godkin Lecturers include C.P. Snow and James Wilson 
Daniel Patrick Moynihan, uh, most recently, uh, MIT's recently retired president, Susan Hockfield. So in that tradition, we're fortunate tonight to have Frank Fukuyama. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, uh, Graham uh, and Dean Elwood, for uh, giving me the honor of, of delivering the Godkin Lecture and being here at the Kennedy School. Uh, I know a lot of people in this institution, and uh, it's really terrific to uh, be with you uh, tonight. And it's also particularly, uh, for me, a pleasure to be able to talk a little bit about uh, Sam Huntington. I actually wasn't a student of Sam's. He was in the Carter administration for most of the time that I was a graduate student in the uh, Gov department. Uh, but he did come back my last year and he gave me a fellowship at the Center for International Affairs. And then his students met every summer uh, for the next 15, 20 years at the Wayano Club in uh, Cape Cod. And so, you know, we actually developed a relationship that extended uh, way, beyond, uh, way beyond Harvard. And um, I should just explain a little bit the origins of the, pro of the project that uh, Graham referred to, these two books on political order. Uh, because it really did come directly from Sam. So in 2005, his 1968 book, Political Order and Changing Societies, which I still believe was in many ways the best book he ever wrote, the first of his major books, had been out of print, but Yale University Press decided to bring it back in print. And Sam uh, did the great honor of asking me to write a new foreword. And so uh, I used the book a lot in my teaching, and I thought about it uh, at some length. I wrote the foreword. But in the course of writing it, I thought, well, this book is foundational, but it also needs to be extended and updated because since 1968, a lot uh, happened. There's this famous line that many people remember, the, the first line in the book that says, the Soviet Union and the United States are both equally developed political orders. And I think after 1989 or 1991, nobody would have said that uh, any longer. Uh, so this is really what, what began the, the project. And uh, as I'll explain, there are many uh, areas in which I think Sam was profoundly right uh, and in which I regard my own uh, two volumes as extending that tradition. Uh, and there are some areas, I think, where he was wrong or where um, uh, subsequent events uh, developed differently. So let me talk a little bit about this. I'll begin just with the background uh, of the 1968 book that he wrote. The background was really modernization theory because the dominant social science paradigm in American uh, academy, and particularly here at Harvard and MIT and among social scientists in Cambridge, uh, was uh, a theory that was imported from social theory in Europe. It kind of came over with a lot of refugees uh, in the 1930s from Hitler's Europe. Uh, and it basically, I think, can be summarized in a simple phrase that all good things go together that the different aspects of modernization, economic growth, social mobilization, uh, changes in culture towards greater uh, individualism uh, and democracy were all part of a seamless single modernization process. They were mutually supportive uh, and they went together as a package. Uh, and I think that Sam's book was really critical in undermining this because uh, you can summarize his work as saying, all things do not go together. That in fact, some aspects of modernization and modernity tend to undermine other aspects, and therefore you can't have all things at the same time. And in particular, he argued that if the rate of social mobilization caused by economic growth, urbanization, education, and so forth outpaced the degree to which political institutions could accommodate participation, then you would have a phenomenon he labeled political decay. And in 1968, the United States was right in the middle of the Vietnam War. There was a tremendous amount of coups, civil wars, uprisings uh, in developing countries in the colonial, ex-colonial world that had just become uh, independent. And Huntington argued that it was actually the rising uh, middle class in these countries, the fact that they had higher expectations that was causing that instability. And therefore, all good things did not uh, go together, and particularly uh, that democracy and uh, this kind of social mobilization uh, had a very uneasy relationship because you really needed uh, authority. 
Uh, and this is actually the second important point uh, or bottom line of his book. He has a phrase uh, very early on that says, uh, you know, Americans like to think about constraining power, but before you can constrain power, you have to generate it. Uh, and that therefore, order was more foundational uh, than democracy, and this led him to uh, theorize about something he called the authoritarian transition, which is actually what South Korea, Taiwan, a number of Asian countries did, where they modernized under the purview of an authoritarian government and only democratized uh, later. His student, Fareed Zakaria, wrote a book called The Liberal Democracy, in which he kind of elaborated uh, that particular development strategy. And Huntington was actually uh, devastating. Uh, and there was no more modernization theory after that book came out. Uh, it was also attacked from the left as being Eurocentric and uh, taking as paradigmatic the uh, development of England and other European, Western European uh, countries. And I think it was a kind of pincer movement with Sam on the right and, uh, and uh, uh, people on the left uh, that uh, basically put pay to this approach to uh, development. Now, there are many areas of continuity where I believe that he was absolutely right and in which my current book tries to extend uh, many of these findings. And the most important of them is this notion that all good things do not go together. So in my view, the fundamental model that he had of a middle class with rising expectations, higher levels of education being profoundly uh, destabilizing have actually been proven uh, to be the case in a lot of recent events that have gone on, beginning with the Arab Spring. Because if you look at who uh, powered the Arab Spring in the early days, it was precisely educated, urbanized um, uh, young people that were uh, used Twitter and technology to communicate, to mobilize, uh, and whose expectations had been cut off by the kind of crony capitalist regime that existed in uh, places like uh, Tunisia and Egypt, and that was really uh, the source of the social unrest that led to the downfall of those dictatorships. But even in democratic countries, in Brazil and Turkey last year, you had uh, major social protests, and I think you saw very much that same phenomenon that Sam talked about in terms of uh, middle classes who are much more politically active than poor people. Poor people, uh, Sam argued, do not make revolutions uh, it's really um, uh, peoples whose expectations uh, have outstripped the ability of their societies uh, to fulfill them. Uh, so in that sense, I think you're still seeing this Huntington phenomenon. Uh, in my book, I talk about other aspects in which the different components of modernization are incompatible or not, they're not incompatible, but they're in tension with each other and in which you really have to make some choices at, at certain points. Uh, one has to do with, uh, I think, a tension between state capacity and democracy, which is something that, that Sam alluded to but did not really uh, develop more fully. So as Graham uh, noted, I have this very simple tripartite way of understanding political order that you have a state which, in Max Weber's terms, is a legitimate monopoly of force, so it's really about uh, the ability to concentrate and use power to enforce laws and uh, deliver services, protect the community. Uh, you have the rule of law, which, if it is really the rule of law, has to constrain the most powerful actors in the society. So if the king or the prime minister can make up the rules as they go along, then it's not the rule of law. So law is fundamentally uh, a constraint on power. And then you have democratic accountability, which we understand these days to be free and fair multi-party elections. So in that very structure, there's a tension. The state is about gathering and, and using power, whereas the rule of law and democracy are both means of constraining power and making sure that power is used only in ways that the community uh, approves. And so therefore, there's already uh, a tension. And I would say it, it goes further than that because uh, you know, the other really important transition uh, is within the nature of the state itself between what Weber called a patrimonial state uh, and what he labeled a modern state. A modern state is a state that treats its citizens impersonally, where it does not matter whether you have a personal relationship. You know, you're the cousin of the prime minister and therefore you get special access to the state. A modern state treats citizens on an equal uh, basis. A 
patrimonial state is one in which the state is regarded as a species of private property. So in the old days, the king literally you know, would say, I own this province and I can give it away to my daughter as a wedding present. Uh, uh, today, uh, nobody dares to actually say they own the countries that they uh, rule over. Uh, so therefore, we have this phenomenon known as neo-patrimonialism, in which you have states that have all the outward trappings of a modern impersonal state, but they're basically run as insider rackets for the self-enrichment uh, of the people running, uh, running the state. Uh, and um, therefore, and, and people go into politics really for the purpose of self-enrichment. You cannot have a modern, uncorrupt state if you do not have a clear dividing line between public and private. And that dividing line in very many uh, countries today is severely uh, eroded. And I guess this is probably the most central conclusion of the book that I've just written, uh, which is that we've spent a tremendous amount of time thinking about democracy and democratic transitions and all of the institutions that constrain the state, the rule of law. There's many programs to establish elections and you know, build legal institutions. Uh, but we have spent much, much less time figuring out how you make that transition from a neo-patrimonial state to a modern state. And I would argue that that is actually a much harder transition to make. It is pretty easy to organize elections. Uh, it is really hard to get rid of pervasive corruption uh, in, in a state. And I think our most recent ex uh, experiences in Afghanistan and uh, Iraq uh, underline that, that we actually held pretty successful multi-party elections in both uh, of those countries. But uh, the core of the state, the legitimate monopoly of force that people would be willing to uh, fight and die for, that is something that does not exist uh, in either of those places. And I would say many of the conflicts that are taking place in the world are actually not conflicts between authoritarian government and democratic government so much as between kind of a neo-patrimonial kleptocratic regime and a regime that tries to be modern. This is really what the fight in Ukraine is all about right now. The, the protesters uh, in Maidan Square uh, would all accept the fact that Viktor Yanukovych was democratically elected in a pretty fair uh, election back in 2010. What they did not want was to live in this kind of kleptocracy where he could siphon off billions of dollars into a bank account or into this palace that he was building outside of uh, Kiev, you know. And I think if you, again, think about what our fight is with, with Vladimir Putin, uh, it's not over democracy. If there's an election held in Russia today, he would be elected by 70, 80 percent. You know, so that's not the question. The question is that he is running uh, this insider racket uh, in which uh, the elite in Russia divides up the resources of the state and shares it among themselves and provides relatively little in terms of impersonal uh, public goods. And I would say that uh, even for countries that are democracies and are not nearly as corrupt, uh, that is really one of the central uh, issues. Uh, the reason that I think that there is a tension between good governance in the sense of that building that kind of modern impersonal state and democracy really comes from the experience of this country, of the United States. Uh, I have several chapters on the origins of the, what we call the patronage or the spoils system. So this starts in the 1828 election where you had John Quincy Adams who went to Harvard University, spoke several foreign languages. His father was the second president of the United States. Uh, typical Boston Brahmin running against Andrew Jackson, who is really the first populist president. Many states by this point had opened up the franchise to all white male voters. And political parties got started initially because they had to figure out how to get people to the polls. And the easiest way to get people to the polls in a country with low levels of income and education is not by offering them impersonal public policies, it's by bribing them individually, by giving them a job in the post office or in the, in the, on the police force. Uh, and Jackson won the election. He said, I won fair and square, so I get to pick who runs the US government. And in any event, it doesn't take a genius to run the American government, so uh, I'm going to fill the government with my supporters. And this begins a 100-year period in American history where Virtually every public official from top to bottom, from the federal government down to you know, Tammany Hall in New York or the 
machines in Chicago and, and Boston, every single official is appointed by a politician as a payoff for political support in, uh, in some election. Uh, and this is why I think that, uh, first of all, we misunderstand what's going on in, in a lot of developing countries today. So we look at Mexico or Brazil or India in which this kind of patronage is rampant. I mean, basically, the politics of these countries revolves around this individualized distribution uh, of state resources. And we say to ourselves, oh, look at these people. They just don't understand what good government is. You know, they're very corrupt and, and uh, you know, they're, they're, just, they're just not with the program. And we do not understand that we went through exactly this phase uh, at a certain point in our own national history. And in fact, I would argue that this kind of patronage is actually not, it should not be regarded as a species of corruption. It ought to be more properly regarded as an early form of democracy. That this is simply the easiest way to get people to the polls to mobilize them uh, in relatively uh, poor countries. And that's why it's going on in all the Mexicos and Brazils and uh, places like that. And so that indicates uh, the tension. And actually, one unfortunate fact is that if you bring democracy to a country before you've consolidated a modern state, you're going to get in trouble. It is very, very hard to build a modern state once you've, you know, once you've expanded the franchise and get everybody into the habit of voting. Uh, the case that I talk at some length about in the book is Greece, uh, because Greece uh, was one of the first European countries to uh, extend the franchise to all males, uh, which they did in the mid-1860s. The Greek state was always weak. It was always illegitimate because it, uh, you know, it was originally an Ottoman state, so it wasn't even a Greek state. But then, it was constantly being manipulated by foreigners, a practice that goes on to the present moment with Angela Merkel and the IMF, you know, hovering in the background. Uh, and uh, therefore, the legitimacy of the Greek state was always very weak. And Greek politicians, the moment democracy came. Uh, basically competed to stuff the public sector with their own political supporters. And that is a problem that continued after the colonel stepped down in 1974 uh, and so on up to the present and explains a lot about uh, the Greek problem. Uh, the way that the United States got out of this uh, is also a story that I think is instructive because uh, essentially it, democracy was the source of the problem in the United States, but it was also the solution that beginning in the progressive era, you had a popular civil society mobilization against corrupt government. So all these grandmothers were really, really upset that their fourth class postmaster was a political hack. You had good leadership from people like Gifford Pinchot or Theodore Roosevelt, the first, uh, one of the first uh, commissioners of the Civil Service Commission. Uh, and you had a triggering event, which was the assassination of Garfield by a would-be uh, uh, office seeker in 18, 82, which then led to the passage of the Pendleton Act because Congress was just too embarrassed uh, to, to continue to support the patronage system uh, at that point. And I think that that's basically the story uh, that will have to play out in places like India or Brazil uh, if they are going to get past uh, this particular stage in political development. Now, I want to conclude by talking about uh, a couple of areas uh, where I actually I either disagree with Sam or uh, where I think that he, uh, he left some important things out. One has to do with that famous authoritarian transition because he really did argue that it would be better as a general rule for uh, countries to live under authoritarian uh, rulers that were developmentally minded. You'd have a generation of economic growth and then you could democratize later. I think that's worked in certain countries, and it has absolutely not worked uh, in other countries. And the b basic problem, you know, every, uh, the people that like this scenario always point to Singapore. Um, and I think the basic problem with this strategy is it, it requires a continuing supply of Lee Kuan Yews. And the big problem with authoritarian government is that there's no way to guarantee that supply. Uh, and this is a real problem, you know, in a country like China, which I grant has been pretty well governed since 1978, but where are they going to keep getting good emperors uh, that will keep you know, leading a, a positive reform process as opposed to outright tyrants? And without checks and balances, 
uh, they can't guarantee that. And so I think, and furthermore, there's nobody in an Olympian position to say, okay, democracy, you wait 20 years. You know, all you hundreds of thousands of protesters in the main square of the city, you go home, you know, grow up, wait 20 years and come back and then we'll democratize. World just doesn't, it doesn't work that way. And so this is not really a viable strategy. The final issue has to do with political decay. Uh, Sam's view of political decay was that that was something that was going on in modernizing uh, societies, but he didn't really contemplate uh, the fact that it could happen uh, in a, a, a modernized country, in a, in a consolidated democracy, uh, least of all in a place like the United States. Uh, my view is that all systems are subject to political decay. Uh, political decay, in my view, has a couple of different sources. One is just simple um, intellectual and institutional rigidity where we worship a certain set of institutions created for certain purposes, but then conditions change and we're not willing to change the institutions. But the other big problem is basically insider capture, uh, that over time you develop well-organized interest groups uh, because of their privilege, they have better access to the state and they try to multiply their privileges by uh, seeking political power. And I think both of these phenomena are uh, evident in the United States uh, today. And I think we have this particular problem where the basic institutions that the Founding Fathers created have overlapped with uh, the current degree of um, political polarization to create a situation that's actually quite uh, quite deadly. So the United States Constitution is built around checks and balances because the Founding Fathers worried about tyranny. They wanted to preserve individual liberty. They created a political system of, of enormous complexity where power is checked in very, very many ways. Uh, and it works uh, uh, worked for much of the 20th century because the two political parties actually overlapped uh, quite considerably, but now that's no longer true. The most liberal Republican is now considerably more conservative uh, than the most conservative Democrat. And under those conditions, um, I argue that the checks and balances system becomes what I call a vitocracy in which well-organized interest groups um, can use their access to the system and use the checks and balances that the system gives them to first protect their narrow interest and then secondly to really block uh, larger initiatives that uh, are uh, in the broader public interest. And so uh, we can you know, talk about whether that's true or not and give some examples of that uh, in the Q&A. Uh, but in any event, um, I think that Sam's legacy uh, is a really uh, important one. He always asked really big questions. Uh, he didn't, in my view, always give the right answer. But I think that in you know, many, many subfields of uh, political science, he really wrote the foundational book. I mean, that's really what was uh, kind of remarkable about him as an intellect. Uh, and I was very proud to, you know, have been associated with him. I, there's a number of people in the audience that were as well. And uh, so uh, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I look forward to any questions that you have. Thank you very much. So great, the way the rules work are there are microphones, two here on the floor and two at the uh, loge and maybe beyond. Uh, in any case, uh, as David often reminds us, uh, in a, in a, introduce yourself, tell us who you are, make your point but succinctly and questions in with a question mark. So the microphones are open, but I'm gonna ask the first question if I can. So, Frank, great argument and a great book, as I said. I think that to locate it in the context of the other debates that are going on here about modernization, development, economic development, political development, let me get you to say how are you similar or, in particular, how are you different from, for example, the Akamoglu Robinson book on why nations fail or the similar volume by North Wallace and wine guests who are also trying to operate yeah. at that same level. Uh, sure, so um, it's actually a great time for grand theorizing because there's actually been a lot of it uh, uh, looking at uh, you know, large periods of uh, history and then why uh, institutions 
um, emerged. And I think the economists uh, now have finally woken up to the fact that institutions matter. Uh, institutions are important, and so they've been trying to incorporate institutions, uh, really this is Doug North's life work, into their own models. And I think both of those books, uh, Violence and Social Orders and Why Nations Fail, uh, provide a very good taxonomy and vocabulary for talking about what kinds of institutions are important for uh, economic uh, growth. Uh, however, I feel that they're missing uh, something uh, important that Sam Huntington actually had in his 1968 book. Uh, there's actually, you know, I think those books are very useful in talking about limited access orders and open access orders or extractive versus inclusive systems. They're good at describing essentially the same transition that I've been talking about from a, you know, patrimonial to a, a modern uh, state, but they don't actually have a dynamic mechanism that explains how you get from one stage to another. And Sam had this. Uh, the, the mechanism was, was, the, was that of social mobilization. Uh, that's not original to Sam. I mean, in a way, that's Karl Marx, right? That you have economic change, it creates capitalism, which then creates a bourgeoisie, which then creates a proletariat. And so all of these new social groups arise as a result of uh, economic change. Uh, and for Sam, that was absolutely central in explaining either why political systems uh, evolved or why they uh, decayed. Uh, and I think that that's somehow gone missing in you know, some of the more rational choice accounts of, uh, of political development. So. Mm -hmm. I think the Loge was first. This gentleman here, please. A little closer. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your speech. My name is John Soyla. I'm a senior at the college. Um, I briefly want to synthesize your idea of you know end of history and the clash of civilizations and ask a question with regards to neo-patrimonial states. If it's possible to think of this idea of democratic accountability as like the final form of, of you know governance that you know we will ultimately get to which doesn't mean there won't be conflict in getting there, but that's the ultimate form. How can we think about these neo-patrimonial states who have their own sort of claims to ontological truth? And this is not just Putin and his authoritarianism or ISIS with, with their, you know, interesting worldview, yeah. but how, how is that uh, gonna go together? And how definitively can we really say that, you know, that democratic accountability is really the end of history? Yeah. No, it's a reasonable point. So, you know, Russia or Nigeria or, you know, a lot of other neo-patrimonial countries don't have an alternative system that, well, I guess Putin is trying to tout an alternative system, but, you know, a lot of them are not systematic alternatives that set themselves up as, as uh, something that you can do if you don't want to be a liberal democracy. They're just, um, you know, they're, they're pretty stable uh, systems in which rents are shared and nobody can do anything about it. And I guess I would say that that's one area where my thinking has been revised because uh, these places actually can be stable. I think the reason that Nigeria uh, has this level of rent distribution is that's the easiest way to maintain control violence in that country. That if anyone causes trouble, you just buy them off by you know, paying them some, uh, some oil rents. And that's actually worked since the end of the Nigerian Civil War in the, in the uh, 1960s. Uh, and I guess this is why I now realize that there's just a lot more contingency in history in, in getting to Denmark, that uh, it, it, there's not just a, a natural driver. I think to the extent there is a driver, it does have to do with economic growth, producing a middle class, producing a social basis for democracy, as Barrington Moore once argued. But there are many other things that have to happen along the way, and nobody can guarantee that that will happen in all societies. Thank you. How about this gentleman? My name is Anders Westfeldt. I'm a doctoral student at the School of Public Health. Uh, so 25 years after the public debate, I'm wondering, do you feel we're heading towards Huntington's vision about a clash of civilization or your own vision? Do you think we've learned anything over the last 25 years that have told us anything about who was right? And do you think there's anything policymakers can do today to affect whether we end up in a, end of in a clash of civilizations or in, uh, or in the end of history? Mm -hmm. Well, 
Uh, <laughs> I wrote a critical review of The Clash of Civilizations when it first came out, and Sam was mad at me for about a year uh, because of that. But I still believe a lot of the things I said in that review, that he is completely right that you know, there are deep cultural differences between different parts of the world that will mean that you're not going to have any kind of easy convergence. Uh, but I think that he underestimated, first of all, whether civilizations are the, the proper unit of account. I think the only part of the world that regards itself as a civilization rather than a nation uh, is the world of Islam, but that in East Asia, you know, they don't think in civilizational terms. It's China, Korea, Japan, you know, very you know, traditional um, uh, national identities. But the other thing is that uh, he didn't take sufficient account of the integrative forces in global development, the fact that communications, transportation, migration uh, is so much easier and ideas travel uh, much more easily. And therefore, the cultural uh, borrowings uh, and the kinds of alternative models that can come from outside your society are uh, much, much greater. And so I do think that there is still this um, integrative force that actually leads to convergence. So if you back up, if you look at the whole 40,000 year history that I cover, what's very interesting is there's several big transitions that occur across all societies regardless of culture. So the first one is a transition from band level societies to tribal societies. Tribal societies didn't exist prior to about 10,000 years ago. And then all of a sudden they appear in many different parts of the world. And then you have the development of state level societies, maybe two, 3,000 years uh, later, and then at a later point, you know, transition to more modern states and, you know, and, and so forth. And this is a process, so specific evolution is where people diverge or species diverge. General evolution is where you develop common uh, responses to the same sets of environmental conditions. And that you also see in human history. So the state is an answer to the limitations of kinship as a form of social organization. The Chinese, the Indians, the Arabs, the Europeans all invent different versions of this thing because they're trying to solve uh, you know, a similar problem. And so for me, the big question is, is democracy or our particular institutional, the, the forms that I've described, uh, is that actually solving a general human problem in human societies that then will lead to a point of convergence? Or are these specific, you know, environmental conditions so overpowering that everybody's going to develop uh, differently. And I would still say that the jury is out on that. Please. Hello. My name is Manuel Melendez, and I'm also a senior at the college. Uh, one of your claims is that it's not always a good idea to democratize when states are still patrimonial. Uh, yet another one of your claims is that in the United States, for example, democratization is mm -hmm. one of the things that help the transition from patrimonial states yes. to modern states. Uh, two questions. Is there a tension between these two claims? And number two, at any rate, uh, do you agree with Huntington that the main impetus for modernization is, is social movements, or do you have other ideas about where that comes from? Uh, I don't think that those two claims are inconsistent. What, what, what matters, I think, actually is social mobilization and the overall level of development, because I said that um, you know, patronage and clientelism are actually quite rational responses to political requirements in low-income societies, which is why you see it so commonly in the developing world and why it was common in the United States in the 19th century. As you get richer, uh, the social conditions change, and so middle-class people with more education, more assets, uh, and the like uh, can't be bribed. I mean, it was interesting in Taiwan, the last election in which clientelism was a major problem was like in 1991. And at that point, it just became too expensive to bribe voters because they were too rich. And so the parties then had to compete on the basis of public policies the way they're, you know, the way they're supposed to. Uh, and um, uh, you know, that's why uh, what's appropriate for one, I think, stage of development is not appropriate for another stage. Uh, I don't have a different theory from Huntington in terms of social mobilization like him. I think that this is an essential uh, dimension of development that, that does ex actually give dynamism to the system. Uh, I think if you want to construct an argument why China may one be day become a democracy, 
It really has to do with the fact that you've got uh, a middle class with you know three, four hundred million uh, members, and that that's just going to grow larger over time. And the way that middle classes in many, many societies, regardless of culture, react to political power is they want more of it, or they want some form of participation. And so, uh, you know, I think that would be the scenario for uh, a gradual, you know, change in the Chinese political system. But it does depend on the level of development. Please, in the lounge. Hi, uh, my name is Rafael Rivera. Uh, I'm from the first year of the MPID program. So uh, one of your main theories of political development is uh, explain the need of the rise of middle income classes for the process of democratization. Yes. However, there are many international examples yes. where middle income classes support authoritarian governments yes. or dictators, like in, in Germany or Italy in the Second uh, World War. Or in Latin America. Or Latin America in the 70s, yeah. exactly. So uh, it seems like middle income classes not necessarily lead to a more democratic right. society. So how can you explain that apparent contradiction? Well, <laughs> You can explain it because life is complicated. So uh, <laughs> uh, I think that you know middle classes follow their own self-interest, and they can see that differently in different circumstances. Uh, in um, particular, when the middle class remains still a minority of the whole population, and you have a lot of poor people, uh, that a lot of times middle class voters actually favor authoritarian government because they don't want to have one man, one vote, where there's going to be a populist politician that will then demand a lot of redistribution. This is exactly what's gone on in Thailand, right? In, in the 1990s, Thailand, the Thai middle classes were in favor of opening up the military uh, system. And in the last 10 years, they've completely turned against democracy because they don't like Thaksin and they don't like the fact that he was supporting all these redistributionist uh, policies. I think that's actually what's holding the Chinese back because I think a lot of the Chinese middle classes have benefited from you know, economic growth. They know that there's a lot of poor people in China, and if there's one man, one vote in China anytime soon, there's going to be huge demands for, I mean, not just instability, but also big demands for uh, redistribution, and that may kill the goose that's laying the golden egg. So that's why I think that actually uh, democracy really only becomes safe when you get a middle class society, meaning that a majority of people are, are middle class, where you know, you don't have this big overhang of extremely poor people that, you know, are going to make uh, demands that the system uh, can't handle. Uh, and, you know, so that's why I think life is complicated. It's just there's basically, you know, Barrington Moore was right about that relationship, but it also depends on other conditions being true as well. Please in the lodge. Rivan Royono, MPAID, first year. Um, Mr. Fukuyama, um, through the Today's established democracies, their democratic evolution um, was absent from international pressure to become yeah. a democracy, which is the exact opposite of, of today's transitional yes. democracy. Do you think that international pressure is doing harm or good? Um, I think that net, it's probably doing good. Uh, I think that uh, it is no longer the case. So <laughs> Uh, you know, Edward Lutvak wrote this article a couple of decades ago called Give War a Chance, where he said, well, you know, in order to get to modern states in Europe, you had to fight wars for several hundred years. And that's the problem with Africa, that they need to fight a lot of wars, uh, you know, and that's what's going to give them strong modern institutions. Uh, and aside from the fact that that's not a very attractive option for the people that live there, uh, I think that it's really not necessary because you don't have to reinvent the wheel in terms of, you know, the, the functioning of uh, many institutions. And there's an international community that actually provides uh, a fair amount of help. Now, what I think uh, the problem is, is that the political basis for this kind of modernization has to come from within the society. Uh, it's very context specific. And when outsiders try to accelerate the process, not by simply providing alternative models, but you know, actually forcing the, the, you know, the process along, uh, they almost always fail uh, because they don't understand those societies. They don't get enough buy-in uh, from the locals. And that's why I think our nation-building efforts in Iraq and Afghanistan you know, didn't, uh, didn't work all that well. But if you look at the modernization, let's say, of East Asia, or the, what the Chinese or the Japanese or the Koreans did, you know, they, they took you, you know, the Japanese basically in, 
In fact, both China and Japan imported the German civil code almost verbatim. Uh, they didn't need to invent it a second time because you know it was it was there already. Uh, so I do think, on balance, you know, the outside, uh, maybe not the pressure, but the outside examples and learning uh, do help the process of uh, political institutionalization. Please. Um, hello, my name is Ellie Watson. I graduated last year. Um, I have two short questions. The first is, within the next generation, where do you see the Chinese political system going? And um, what are the factors that are pushing it one way or the other? My other question is with regards to the role and value of religion and culture um, in political governance. Uh, where do you see that going, particularly in the Middle East? And you know, would you just you know, eliminate it, yeah. or do you see value in using it? Well, <laughs> with regard to two, the first- Two small questions. Yeah, with regard to the first question, um, it seems to me that the current Chinese political system and economic system is not sustainable in, in many respects. Uh, that um, you know you do have this internal pressure coming from you know a growing middle class with, with much greater expectations for the level of services and and, and, and so forth. The economic model uh, needs to shift you know very dramatically to uh, domestic consumption. They're you know they're moving along pretty uh, well with that, but. Uh, there's still a lot of liabilities in terms of, you know, environment, in terms of corruption, in terms of, you know, the perception of many people and the fundamental uh, illegitimacy of a lot of the things that the government does. I mean, there's several thousand violent social protests in China every single year that, you know, we don't hear that much about, but it indicates a degree of, you know, social unrest that uh, uh, is quite substantial. But I think this, well, so the two largest liabilities uh, are first the fact that there is no governing moral system to legitimate the whole thing. That it's a mishmash of, you know, Marxism-Leninism and traditional Confucianism, and then just outright, you know, kind of self-interest. Uh, uh, and they have not resolved, you know, on what basis they're gonna be regarded as legitimate uh, other than performance. And then with regard to the performance, they have not solved this fundamental issue that all uh, authoritarian regimes need to uh, solve which is the bad emperor problem. You know, authoritarian systems are great when you've got a good emperor like Li Kuan Yu or Deng Xiaoping. Uh, if you get a bad emperor, you're really in trouble because there's no checks and balances. And right now what's going on in China, uh, Xi Jinping is undertaking this massive purge. Uh, he's set to be the most powerful leader in China since Deng or maybe even since Mao Zedong. We have no idea whether he's gonna be a good emperor or a bad emperor. You know, and people will present both scenarios. They're equally plausible right now. We just don't know. And if he turns out to be a bad emperor, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's bad. <laughs> um, in terms of the Middle East and religion, I mean, I think, you know, this is an area where I agree actually with Sam much more than people think, uh, that culture is, you know, it, it is in fact important. One little element in my book that I didn't really highlight because it's kind of an embarrassing fact, but if you look at the countries that really invented good, clean, modern government, very many of them were actually run by Calvinists. So the great elector in Prussia was a Calvinist in a Lutheran society. He brought in all these Huguenots and Dutch bureaucrats because he didn't trust the local, you know, the local elites uh, in England and in the Dutch Republic itself. Uh, you know, the Puritans, you know, that, that modernized the English state were all Calvinists, and then. You know, Calvinism was important in the progressive era in the United States uh, and in the reform of the British system in the 19th century. So that's just a little footnote that I, I'm not saying that everybody needs Calvinists. Uh, there may be functional equivalents of Calvinism in other, you know, in other traditions. Um, you know, I guess with regard to Islam, it's always seemed to me that any complex cultural system can be interpreted in many, many different ways. So if you ask in the 1930s, is Catholicism compatible with democracy? Many people would quite reasonably have said no, because you know, they're supporting Franco and you know, they're on the wrong side of all these big uh, conflicts, but something happened you know, to reinterpret the doctrine, especially after Vatican II. That, in fact, that was one of Sam's big points in the third wave, is that the third wave of democratization happened because of Christianity, basically because Catholicism you know, uh, shifted positions. Uh, and so I, I guess my feeling is that the reason that people sign up 
for ISIS and other radical movements has to be explained more sociologically or psychologically rather than in terms of you know the necessary outcome of a particular religious doctrine that you know if you're unemployed not that well educated you don't fit into your society you don't have a girlfriend then yeah you go fight in Syria because you get community unity you know uh, comradeship risk which a lot of people really like uh, that your society isn't providing for you and so that's kind of got to play itself out but it's not necessarily tied you know specifically to to Islam so I hope I hope that's right and we'll we'll have to see okay this gentleman please and, and I should have said before, one question to a customer. Yeah. We'll do one. Thank you for being here today, Professor Fukuyama. My name is Juan Izaguirre. I'm a joint degree student of the Business and the Kennedy School. My question is a follow-up uh, of the, the Clash of Civilization comment, uh, uh, the Clash of Civil uh, Civilization comment that you just made. Where do you foresee the main source of conflict in the, in the coming years, uh, between nations, within nations? Where, where, where are your thoughts on, on that side? You know, I, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so let me answer it in a different way. Let me tell you the things that worry me. Okay, so uh, I am right now in 2014 very worried about nationalism. I think in the long run, uh, you know, we're, uh, we've shown that we can get beyond it, but I think that in East Asia, for example, the level of nationalism is really frightening. You know, in China, Japan, uh, Korea and so forth. I think the Putin has set off a very, very dangerous dynamic by upsetting the territorial agreement that ended the Soviet Union, where basically Russians outside of Russia would be content to live in those countries, and now he's basically told them, you know, no, we're going to come uh, and help you. And so I think that's going to be, you know, tremendously uh, destabilizing at both ends of uh, of East Asia. Uh, I worry about um, not just income inequality, but the underlying dynamic uh, behind that that has been eroding uh, middle class employment in developed countries. And that's one where I really don't see an obvious solution because it does seem to me that a lot of that is really due to the progress of technology, which is, you know, you can slow it down and you can compensate the losers uh, to some extent, but you fundamentally can't do much about that. And in terms of the stability of established democracies, I think that's, uh, uh, that's going to be very dangerous. And I think you're already seeing the political manifestations of the reaction to that in terms of the rise of you know, populist parties, uh, both in the United States and in, uh, and in Europe. And in the long run, I think you know, that seems to me that could easily get uh, worse rather than better. Uh, and you know, I think we're facing probably a 30-year Sunni-Shiite war civil war in the Middle East. Uh, I, my personal opinion is we, the United States, ought to stay out of this because we're not wise enough to figure out how to end it. And you know, we need to contain it and manage it rather than try to solve it. But you know, that region is going to go through you know, uh, a lot of turmoil. So that's how I'd answer the question. That's what I worry about right now. OK, please. Hi, good evening. Um, thank you so much for being here today. My name is Manur Khan, and I'm a sophomore at the college. I was just wondering, in your view, how does the concept of a liberal democracy that relies on institutions as its power base deal with or come to terms with the idea of informal institutions and the problems that it brings, especially since democracy has just boiled down to this concept of elites swapping in and out of power amongst themselves? Well, you know, all workable social systems depend on some combination of formal and informal institutions. And Many uh, informal institutions are actually very helpful to the working of the system. So a classic example of that is American civil society. You know, this is a tradition that goes back to Tocqueville, where he said the American Art of Association is critical to the success of American democracy because it allows people, gives them an avenue towards participation. This is something that Bob Putnam you know, argued very strongly. I mean, he said that it was in decline, but he accepted you know, the importance of uh, civil society. Uh, I think religion, if you regard religion as a kind of informal social institution, uh, the impact of that is, is different in different societies. And 
by and large, I think the nature of sectarian Protestantism in the United States actually was helpful. You know, the civil rights movement uh, in the United States came out of, uh, you know, a deeply uh, Christian tradition. And so, uh, yes, there are many informal bad institutions. The mafia is one of them and elite cliques and, you know, all this stuff uh, uh, happen as well. But I think any complete social system simply cannot be governed by formal rules and it needs this matrix of, you know, social organizations that, uh, that support it. Okay, I think we're getting close to the end, but we'll take this, uh, or I'm sorry, this gentleman here, this lady, and then here, then we'll have to stop, so please. Short questions and short answers. Hi, I'm Arjun Kapoor, I'm a junior in the college. So you talk a lot about how advanced societies experience political decay. So I wondered, how do, can those societies escape from that decay, and can you think of any examples of societies <clears throat> that have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so the story I told about the progressive era was one. You know, that in a certain sense, uh, the American government was captured uh, by various, you know, elites in the 19th century. And the way we got out of it was by political mobilization and political uh, action. So in this country right now, if you're worried about interest groups and you're worried about, you know, money and politics and so forth, what's the solution to it? You know, you, it's exactly the same. There has to be a grassroots civil society based movement that wants change. You have to have leaders. Uh, you have to have... I think policy intellectuals that formulate the problem properly so that people mobilize around the, the right uh, solutions. Uh, and then it probably takes a triggering event, some exogenous shock to the system that, like the Garfield assassination, I mean, you don't want uh, another assassination, but you know, something, a crisis or something uh, that, that brings everything together. I think that's the way that political reform has always happened, and I think that's the way we will get out of the current uh, problem that we have. Please. My question follows upon that one. I'm Martha Bayless. I teach yep. at Boston College. Um, it has to do with your current your remarks you just made, but the remarks you made earlier about political decay in the United States. And to me, there's three ways to understand that. One is the particularities of our institutions, our history, and our current environment. The second is that somehow um, uh, de democratic systems mm -hmm. are because of current conditions in the world more in decay. And there you would have to talk about Europe and other democratic societies. And then the third is that somehow democracy has had its day, uh, that it was tried and it has been shown to be dysfunctional, which is of course a different end of history than the one that you've written about in the past. Um, do you talk about all three of those in the end of uh, volume two? Uh, uh, yes. Which is most salient to you right now? Yeah. So I really do not believe number three. I mean, I don't think that there's any kind of general decay. Uh, and I actually, number two, I don't really believe either. I think there's a lot of democracies in the world that are working pretty well. Uh, you know, all the Commonwealth countries, Germany, Netherlands, you know, Scandinavia, their systems, they've all got problems if you look at them up close, but they're functioning pretty well. So I think the decay problems are, you know, I would say Italy, Japan, United States have all in certain way had Similar problem. I put also India in this category, where because of the checks and balances, it's been very hard to come up with sufficiently decisive government to solve, you know, important questions. And again, the whole issue is: is democracy self-correcting? The theory says it should be because people will mobilize to solve the problem and then do it. But I just don't think there's any necessary reason to think that this will always and necessarily happen. And I don't see the, the, you know, the foundations for it right now in the United States. Thank you. So you get the last question. Right here, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm a freshman in college. And my question is, um, you mentioned that Wait, China... Introduce yourself, yeah. Oh, I'm Kay, and I'm a freshman at college. I'm, I'm from China, so uh, I'm asking a question about China. So you mentioned that China has um, lots of social protests and you believe that China's development is not uh, sustainable. But it seems that uh, although uh, we have lots of small protests, there is never a large scale national protest. Mm -hmm. And the China's regime seems pretty stable. So do you think that recent protests in Hong Kong will, be, will have actual influence in pushing China's uh, transformation? Yeah. Or will it just be an insignificant accident? Will the student protesters have actual bargaining chips? 
Yeah, I uh, don't think that the protests are going to spread uh, to China. Uh, first of all, I, I don't think that the conditions are right for any kind of generalized protest in China because the country is doing too well. Uh, so I think that, you know, in, in my view, the, ch the future state of China that you need to look to is one in which economic growth has slowed down or even gone into reverse very substantially. It's going to happen sooner or later. I mean, no country maintains the kind of rate of growth that China has experienced in the last few decades, you know, when they're trying to become a high-income uh, country. Uh, so that's the kind of background condition where I think the social mix will get a little bit more uh, combustible. But, you know, you have to say that the Chinese government is also very good at dealing with protests because they don't simply repress it. You know, they actually respond to citizen demands in a way that many authoritarian countries do not do. Uh, and so that mix of repression and accommodation is really, I think, part of the secret of what's kept them going. But I just think that they'll become, they'll, China will get to a point where that formula, you know, stops working. And that's the point where I think politically you're going to have the possibility for more serious kinds of instability. Thank you. Well, on that note, it's my unhappy uh, responsibility to say that the evening is over. Let me remind you of this book if you want very good follow-up in terms of uh, discussion. I thought very good questions and terrific answers. Let's say thanks very much to Frank. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.